Namo Tassa Bhagavato. <laughs> you literally. <laughs> Sorry, you did the whole thing. <coughs> Arahato Samma Sambuddhasa. Namo Tassa Bhagavato. Arahato Samma Sambuddhasa. Namo Tassa Bhagavato. Arahato Samma Sambuddhasa. Bhutam Dhammam Sangham Namasami. Right now, I wish I had the Brahma voice <laughs> and if we could dispense with this microphone. Um, but uh, this is the uh, day that we're in, this present era. And um, we have the blessings and the difficulties of technology. So um, this is uh, what they may say is things as they are. Um, so everyone can hear me well. And I'm wondering about that light because it's kind of blinding. I don't know what could be done about that. For, is it all right? Oh, thank you. Uh, yes, so um, there is a, a practice that uh, Buddha had taught. It's not so well known um, these days, but um, actually it's something in monastic life the idea of reflecting on the teaching. In the time of the Buddha, there wasn't these ways to record. There were, in fact, many people were illiterate. The, the majority of the people didn't have written words, so they had to memorize. Um, I, I do have some papers here because my memory <laughs> is not so good, and I've been dependent on the written word. So. Um, but there is an idea about reflecting <laughs> on teachings. So I'm going to invite you all to reflect on some teachings that I have in print. So <laughs> I'm taking advantage of this modern uh, technology called the printed word. <laughs> it's not electronic. It's in paper form. <laughs> um, and we're going to be cont contemplating a word. And this is, uh, I'll tell you the word in Pali. And it, um, as many of the Pali words in the uh, Buddhist teaching, uh, this word is multifaceted. It has uh, different contexts. In different contexts, it has different meanings. And in, am I holding this the right way? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, you can hear. Uh, and, um, but I think the Buddha also used words that were really rich in meaning uh, to convey something uh, at a lot of different levels. And a lot of, um, I've heard other teachers, Ajahn Amaro actually was the first one I heard speak to this, but Often you hear arguments about a Pali word and what it actually means, but there is no one word that actually encompasses the richness of that. So the word uh, I'm going to uh, speak about today is apamada. And uh, some of you may know this word, um, but it means, it's translated often as diligence and um, heedfulness, but there's also carefulness, uh, attentiveness, uh, caring thoroughly for something, caring. Um, what I really appreciate is the idea, it's not just kind of a, diligence might sound uh, almost militaristic or something really kind of like, you know, just really um, 
powering into something and staying with it. There is a steadfastness to it, but there's also this care. And um, I looked at the English words too. I have, uh, let's see, it's gotten out of order. Here's the first page. Um, I have the translation also of the English words, or at least one of the English words that's associated with uh, apamada. And, um, well, here, both heedful. Heedful is aware, attentive to something or someone, giving close and thorough attention. So this is the English uh, word heedfulness. And uh, diligent, constant in effort to accomplish something, attentive and persistent in doing anything. And then there's the Middle English, is coming from the Old French, and from Latin. <laughs> and Latin, actually, poly uh, is uh, the, the language migrated um, and transformed as people migrate. And there is uh, Latin. In Latin, there's poly uh, origins. So this is quite interesting how uh, these words are, uh, they travel through time and transform. But there is, from Latin, there's diligens for diligent, and as assiduous from diligre is love, take delight in. So there's this aspect of which um, caring, love, uh, attentiveness, a steadfastness. And what comes to mind when I think about this is a, a parent or somebody who, who cares for a child. And there's all uh, these aspects to caring for the child. And or, or it may be some um, life's work that's really important like a, an art or a science or something, this dedication to that. So this is um, what we bring to our practice, is this apamada, this caring attentiveness, this, uh, the diligence which uh, is persistent, attentive, caring, as you would what for your, uh, something really important in your life, something that's uh, bringing you joy as well. So um, this is all um, what we give to our practice is, and through the day in our daily life, not just on the cushion, uh, attentiveness to what we're doing um, to support ourselves, but also to other people in our lives. We're bringing this uh, diligence of care, and it starts with the mind. All actions, according to the Buddha, come from the mind. And according to reality, actually, things as they are, but he states it in one of the Dhammapada verses, that it's led by the mind, all our actions. So if we... Um, attend diligently to our mind, heedfully to our mind, then everything that comes from those actions through body, speech, and mind, uh, we're doing with care, we're doing with joy, we're doing with um, just that um, sense of, of steadfast, steadfastness and uh, love. So I have here a verse uh, from the Dhammapada, and um, I would like to, uh, first I'll say the Pali, and then I will read one of the translations, 
And I'd like you to spend a little time just contemplating the, the verse. Uh, I'll read it more than once so we can contemplate what comes up. Uh, just think from this uh, explanation of the actual one of the words of the verses and then um, how the Lord Buddha expressed it in verse. <clears throat> so this is uh, the second book in the Dhammapada. There's a whole section of verses. They're called books or chapters. Uh, so it's the Apamada Wago. And uh, so that's the second waga. Apamado amata padam, pamado machino padam, apamata namayanti, ye pamata yatamata, e tam we say sato nyatwa, Apamadam hi pandita, Apamade pamodanti, Arianang gochare rata, Te jana jayani o sata, excuse me, Te jani o sata tika, Nicham dalhal parakama. Pusanti dira nibanam, yoga kemam anuttaram. So this is translated as heedfulness is the way to the deathless. The heedlessness is the way to death. The heedful do not die. The heedless are as, as if dead. So we can think about that for a moment. And we continue on. The wise, having clearly understood this about heedfulness, rejoice in heedfulness, delighting in the noble one's resort, they, practicing jhana, persevering, always endeavoring, wise, resolute, attain nibbana, the unequaled security from bondage. So this is um, Ayasobana and Ayanianika uh, went through the entire Dhammapada and translated verses. They did their own translation as a means of really going deeply into the word of the Buddha. Um, so we could spend a lot of time on these verses. Uh, but um, I think we can just also take it on the um, translators, trust the translator. Um, and I would like to actually do a comparison. And this is Bhante Sujato's translation. Heatfulness is the state, is the deathless state. Heedlessness is the state of death. The heedful do not die, while the heedless are like the dead. Understanding this distinction, when it comes to heedfulness, the astute rejoice in heedfulness, happy in the noble one's domain. They who regularly meditate, always staunchly vigorous, those wise ones realize quenching the supreme sanctuary from the yoke. So 
So the Lord Buddha put a lot of importance on uh, this quality, apamada. And some people might be thinking, this sounds a lot like sati or mindfulness. A lot of these qualities are, uh, seem to be, to me, that's what occurred to me. It's like, oh, this is a very akin to sati. It's just this, um, these words uh, ha overlap a lot, the, the meaning, the, but, but the um, intention of our mind and the qualities that we wish to uh, cultivate. Uh, this is, uh, it doesn't, maybe it doesn't matter what we're calling it, <laughs> but there is a lot of interwoven meaning in uh, different Pali words. So they're, they're mutually supportive. These words are uh, of this quality of mind that we're trying to cultivate, the supporting uh, stillness of mind and wisdom, the arising of wisdom, and uh, our ability to take care throughout our entire day, caring for our mind, caring for our actions, caring for each other, <laughs> So um, the, there's just a lot of different levels to this. And um, you notice there's a comparison to, it says both translations use the word heedful and heedless, or uh, diligent or negligent is uh, another way of, could be translated. But I have the word pomado, this is the opposite. And that's uh, translated as heedlessness, carelessness, negligence, indolent. And then, so this is kind of a, a lazy or default uh, state that we may go into and we go into our bad habit patterns. So bringing uh, diligent awareness to these habit patterns and um, redirecting, uh, uh, tr retraining ourselves, if we notice uh, any of this uh, pamada, this ne negligence, if we notice uh, we're slipping into unwholesome activities of body, speech, or mind. So, um, there's a... Um, See here. Uh, there's a um, Apamada Sutta, and uh, this talks about this. It says, uh, mendicants, this is Bhante Sujato's translation, so you hear the word mendicants, and it's likely to be his. Mendicants, you should be diligent in four situations. What for? Give up bad conduct by way of body, speech, and mind, and develop good conduct by way of body, speech, and mind. And don't neglect these things. Don't be pamada. Don't, this is neglecting. Give up wrong view and develop right view. Don't neglect this. So he's talking to us to be telling us to be diligent, to be giving up unwholesome conduct, bad conduct. I think, Bhante uh, Sajjata, I don't have the poly in front of me. Oh, actually, I do have it somewhere. No, I don't. Okay. Of uh, this particular, no, it's not that one. Uh, so this is Bhante Bodhi's translation, because there are four occasions when heedfulness should be practiced. What for? Abandon bodily misconduct and develop good bodily conduct. Do not be heedless in this. Abandon verbal misconduct and develop good verbal conduct. Do not be heedless in this. 
abandon mental misconduct and develop good mental conduct. Do not be heedless in this. Abandon wrong view and develop right view. Do not be heedless in this. When they have abandoned and developed these, they need not fear death in the future. So this is um, an example of applying heedfulness. So this awareness of our bad mental, our unhelpful, unwholesome uh, mental habits is really important. And this is actually right effort. You can see how these things, you have sati, elements of sati, or mindfulness. You have elements of right effort here that's supported by this apamada. It's integrated and in, um, mutually supported qualities of mind that we're developing. So um, very kindly, with kindness to ourselves, like a small child, when we see the unwholesome behaviors arise through body, speech, and mind, we very carefully attend to them, like a, a very skillful parent would um, speak to their child and correct their child. So we, we can do that for ourselves. When we uh, observe, we have, first thing is attentiveness, like a, like a small child you would be watching constantly. And then you see them heading in the wrong direction. It's good before they get into something that's dangerous, you're gonna stop them. <laughs> uh, so this is protecting the mind, protecting one's, one's own speech and actions. It's a uh, not a kind of um, really like st overly strict and controlling, but out of care and concern, just guiding, carefully guiding ourselves. And because the Buddha, <laughs> he, he didn't just assume that because we were Buddhists or meditators or on, on the path and, uh, under, undertaking the Dhamma into our, taking the Dhamma into our, heart, our hearts, it didn't mean we automatically just ab all our unwholesome qualities just dissolved. Or just because we go into robes doesn't mean suddenly we're enlightened or something like that. There's work to do. We have work to do. Uh, and it's just like what, when a child is born, they have to learn. So no matter where we are on the path, until we're our haunts, we're, we have work to do. So we do this with kindness, attentiveness, carefulness, steadfastness, um, joy. There's that joy there, too. I don't know how I'm doing on time, but. What? Okay, so I have 15 minutes, is it? A few minutes, okay, I guess I might. might. We'll do Q&A after this, so. Okay. ended now, we'd have 15 minutes for Q&A. Okay. okay, so, therefore, <laughs> we, will get, we will get to the crux of the matter here. Okay, so um, this is how important this word was or maybe the idea behind it. Um, when the Buddha was passing away, his final instructions uh, to the bhikkhus, or all the community, bhikkhus, bhikkhunis, uh, and the uh, lay disciples, and this is in the um, Samyutta Nikaya, if you, you love to look at the suttas, as well as in the Diga Nikaya. So Diga Nikaya 16 is a Parinibbana Sutta. And uh, in the Brahma Samyutta, uh, it's SN 615, <laughs> those who love to look up references. Uh, 
there is this one that I'm extracting this one line, the last instructions to the uh, community. Vayadama Sankara Apamadena Sampadeta. So this is the final dis instructions. And I'll read the extract here. Then the Buddha said to the mendicants, Come now, mendicants, I say to you all, conditions fall apart. Persist with diligence. And there's another translation here. That's Bhante Sujato's. Now I address you, bhikkhus. Formations are bound to vanish. Strive to attain the goal with diligence. This was the last utterance of the Tathagata. Oh, that's Bhante Bodhi's translation. Disciples, this I declare to you. All conditioned things are subject to disintegration. Strive on untiringly, untiringly for your liberation. This is Sister Wajira and Francis Story's translation. So... All of you, I wish you to strive on with diligence. Apply yourselves to the Dhamma well. Han tamayang tama kata satu karang kata mase satu satu satu. Anumotami. Thank you so much, Aya. It's a pleasure to hear those words in Pali and English. Um, and we have time for a Q&A with the Ayas right now, so about 15 minutes. Um, if you're on Zoom, raise your electronic hand. Otherwise, if you're in the audience, raise your normal hand, and you can take advantage of this chance to ask uh, either venerable. And I think we have three mics running around, so maybe one of them could come over here, actually. So please raise your hand. Thank you so much. Um, uh, my question relates to the fact that um, through studying Dharma, I uh, kind of the goal is to have a good life, develop good stability, um, et cetera. And I find it's really, uh, if I just trust, uh, I trust myself and go with uh, instincts I tend to, you know, go off into imagination and kind of wanting to have fun and, and real simple stuff that everybody does. But it's uh, it's a little bit um, perplexing to me why that is so consistently uh, appealing without without heedfulness. That if I really pay attention to the results, I can see there's some downsides that I don't want. Um, but my question is around why is it so persistent over years that you're still not taking in the lesson, you're still wanting to go towards imaginary, uh, you know, wanting and, and uh, hoping things will, you know, each day I find something to really <laughs> want, may not be heedful. Why so persistent? Oh, thank you for your question, that's a, a good question. Um, I think that um, some of our habit patterns are through lifetimes or because of um, just survival. Uh, there's a, um, there's a, what's, it, what's pleasant is desirable, what's unpleasant is undesirable. And a lot of, it started out uh, just to survive, you know, um, 
now we have a lot of artificial protections and comforts and things like that and very easy to obtain things that are pleasurable. Uh, and so we fall into habit patterns uh, based on what is comfortable, what is we're, we're familiar with, what is um, desi some idea of desire. So the first thing is to really observe where, what the patterns are, what these habit patterns are. And uh, the Buddha in the Dweda Vitaka Sutta talked about examining the mind and seeing what's helpful or beneficial and what's unhelpful, unbeneficial, unbene unwholesome, and just just dividing these things up. So it start all things start for all actions start from the mind. So um, just bringing awareness to our daily activities too and see. Uh, actually see if something is harmful, really acknowledging the harm to ourselves or to other people. Um, and then, uh, like I was saying, not to get really strict or hard or, and you don't want to add uh, unwholesome to unwholesome or unskillful to unskillful by getting hard on yourself because, oh, I keep falling into this old habit pattern um, but we can observe it for a while and then make a resolve and say, I wish to change that habit, whatever it is. And then, um, good to substitute, not just stop. Okay, this is an unwholesome. I used to work in alcohol and drug treatment. So instead of, uh, the, I'm not saying this is you, but the, the alcoholic, instead of picking up a bottle, they would pick up a phone and they would talk to a friend and they'd say, you know, I have this urge to do this. So it may be helpful to have a friend even to talk to about some of the things that you'd like to ch change. And um, Well, there's something really formalized like the sila of when you take five precepts. You do that as a group. You make this really strong affirmation of keeping uh, things well. So it may be either uh, to yourself and to a friend or just privately, I wish to change this habit. Uh, and just make it really intentional because you, you've seen the harm and then I wish to substitute it by doing something <laughs> differently. So I don't know what, what you're talking about specifically, but um, like, uh, let's say I, I'm using useless speech a lot. I'm engaging in useless speech, and I see that in myself, and I see how distracted I get and how scattered I am. So I make a resolve. I'm going to abandon useless speech. And then, uh, then in substituting that, I will uh, be mindful before I speak. And that's, this is really hard. It's, just, it's difficult. Changing is, this kind of thing is difficult. So it may be after the fact, or I see myself starting to say something, or I've said a few words, and then I think, oh, that's actually not very important to speak about. And I may say to my friend, oh, uh, never mind, or uh, I just, if uh, my friend here in robes, we may have a little, uh, I would say, okay, I made this resolve to abandon useful, useless speech. And that, I would try to abandon useless speech. So, <clears throat> excuse me. So then I, I might say, oh, that wasn't quite useful, was it? And I might just stop there. <laughs> yeah, hopefully, for her sake. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so I think you might get the idea, you know, you, you may have someone who can help you with it or internally say, oh, I see, let's say I'm drinking too much coffee and I see myself heading to a place to prepare coffee and I might say, oh, I told myself not to do this, didn't I? Or I might be actually be preparing the coffee and I say, do I really? You can stop anywhere along the line. I 
Oh, oh that, that's, this is not ideal. Yeah. This is not, so we're, we were saying, okay, we have this uh, uh, agreement not to eat and uh, do multi-tax while eating. So well, uh, they realized that they had started to do two things at once. Uh, so uh, they said, this is not ideal. <laughs> <laughs> so you might have a little word, a little word like that to say, okay, I see myself going into the uh, unwholesome habit. Uh, my new habit is to acknowledge that I got into that. And then uh, I'm, I'm starting to train myself as you would, uh, I don't know how many people here are parents or <laughs> grandparents, but to the child or the grandchild or the niece or whoever, how many times do you have to tell them, you know, shut the door quietly. Don't slam the door. And then I saw somebody taking a, uh, a child and having them close the door repeatedly quietly <laughs> <laughs> to practice closing. And I, I sometimes I, for myself, uh, I will, if I see that the door doesn't latch well, and I'm closing it and it's not completely latching, I will practice doing, I've, we've, I've been staying at a number of different places through my monastic life, so different doors work differently, right? So this is forming a habit by actually practicing latching it well. <laughs> so uh, this is just a... Uh, my kind of a metaphor maybe for other unwholesome habits, but just acknowledging to ourselves and then repeatedly trying to replace it with a wholesome habit. And making a resolve, yes, a resolve is important. So. Uh, thank you. I have a couple questions. I think they're closely related. Uh, one is, recently there's been a lot of people around me that seem like they're on the verge of giving up their goodness because they don't see the results in their life. They say, my effort doesn't add up to what's happening. So just curious how you talk to people about how to not attach to results. And the second one is about karma. It's very hard for me to explain karma to folks who are not. I can't. It's hard, very hard to explain karma, karma for folks who are not Buddhist. Okay. I'll say, well, maybe the karma doesn't come out in this life. Maybe it comes out in the next. But almost inevitably, I get the response saying, well, look, this person seemingly is not so good, and they have a favorable rebirth in this life or this person seemingly is great, but they had a really horrible rebirth in this life. And then it's hard for me to respond to that or explain that. So, um, yeah, that, that's important to think about um, if one is doing something very beneficial, um, that you may not see the results right away. That, that's just how things are. And um, it is important to bring in the idea of karma, that the results um, may not be seen right away. And if we think of uh, the multiple rebirths that uh, a, any being may have, yeah, there may be this comma fruition in this lifetime, but there's so many other conditions, not just the comma. There's just the, you know, like a environmental, the, the uh, weather, <laughs> the um, many different, uh, this how society is, and um, there's a physical aspects and, and also just the, uh, throughout time, uh, comma. So 
uh, trying to explain to somebody, it, it depends on your relationship, the importance it is for them to understand that. I mean, for yourself, if you understand it well, uh, that's really wonderful. And uh, not to expect anything is probably the best attitude. To abandon goodness, uh, well, how, what joy do we have really in when we're doing unwholesome activities? If we can uh, really recognize the harm for ourselves and others. And that, that's a really good uh, guideline. If, if my actions are harming myself or harming others or harming both, uh, we're not bringing more happiness to the world. This is uh, bringing, increasing the suffering in the world. And uh, maybe I'm doing something for others, or maybe I'm purifying my mind and it's difficult. I want to give up. It's so hard to ch change your habits. I might feel discouraged. But um, somehow finding joy in just that goodness. What, what, what good things can we do in the world for ourselves and for others that bring up joy? What's, what's wholesome that, I mean, uh, uh, we just had the meal offering today and those who prepared it, uh, I think some may have had this joy in their heart for this opportunity to share, to give. And uh, just that giving of ourselves, doing something to help, you know, not just the monastics, but others. Uh, and uh, it, things don't come easily. People want, this is society, you know, we want things to be fast and easy and comfortable. But that's not reality. Fast, easy, and comfortable ends up in suffering because we keep wanting to get more and more comfort and pleasure. And, and so there's always this dis-ease, this discomfort with it. So uh, just, for, just being an example also, depending on your relationship with the people that you're trying to speak to about this, um, I think your example may be the best way to convey uh, what you would like to share with others. And just um, be patient, because not everybody can hear. Uh, not everybody is, wants to hear the Dhamma now. But it, just like we're talking about the fruition of what you're saying to these people may not be immediate or quick or anything, and over time, if you have a long-term relationship with that person, you might be surprised someday where they come to you and they've heard it somewhere else. And they tell you this. They haven't been paying attention, really. And they say, oh, you know what? <laughs> I, I heard somebody talking about how uh, good things, are, don't, you don't always get good results right away. And that just to be, to be patient and, and take joy and and just uh, what we're doing immediately, taking joy in the generosity or whatever goodness, and they'll be telling you. <laughs> you know, I've had that happen where I've given, I've been saying the same thing to somebody, and then I notice, oh, they they are they they think they've heard it somewhere else, but they actually heard it from me first. <laughs> and then that's all right, that's perfectly fine, and it may be other lifetimes as well. You know, maybe in this lifetime, they're not ready to hear it. Or maybe 10 years from now, they're, they're ready to hear it. So just uh, be the good example in their life. So um, that's what I'd like to offer. <laughs> <laughs>